When we were putting this together, we thought that such a formidable topic as this one deserved a big, bold, black and white title. So there it is. <laughs> However, it also is far too big a topic to cover adequately in the time that we have. So what I think we decided was that the appropriate thing to do was to concentrate on the key word in the title, which is, of course, access. And so I'm not going to say much today about access to scholarly materials, but I'm going to try to provide some context to the current efforts, for the current efforts to improve access to the law. And there are several things that I think that we need to bear in mind. Uh, one is that even if access is now the driver for thinking about legal information, as long as accessibility to that information is premised on digital formats, access through time is dependent on preserving that information. And preserving of digital materials poses new questions that didn't have to be faced when we lived and worked in a print environment. Uh, the 2005 report of the Legal Information Preservation Alliance that's cited up here uh, identified the risk factors for digital media as being storage media obsolescence, the idea that you need to refresh the data periodically. You need to move it from one storage medium to the next as the media change over time. There's also software obsolescence to be concerned about, and that's the idea that access and viewing applications change in many, such as PDF, are proprietary and are in many ways subject to the whims of the market. There are also cultural and organizational challenges, the need for careful management by the creators and the caretakers of digital materials in archives or things that are referred to as archives to avoid problems such as link rot, the disappearance of materials from the link to which they were initially attached, deletion, and other problems, all of which are unknown in the print environment. So when we think about access, it means more than simply accessibility. Legal texts have to be authenticated. This is a problem unknown in the print era before published texts could be easily created and altered and manipulated in electronic formats. It was pretty easy to tell when a print text had been altered. Legal texts have to be preserved. And this isn't simply a matter of making sure that they're printed on low acid paper or maintaining proper temperatures and humidity levels for storing books and microfilm. In accessibility, we have to think about this not only in terms of ease of access, but also, again, the need to make sure that the texts are permanently accessible. Uh, it's worth noting, I think, that the American Association of Law Libraries has had preservation of legal information as well as access to legal information for the public as a long-standing concern. As far back as 1981, AELL established a standing committee on legal information services to the public. In 2003, the association issued a state-by-state -state, uh, report on permanent public access to electronic government information which was followed in 2007 by another state-by-state -state report, this one on authentication of online legal resources, which was updated earlier this year. In 2008, in December, AELL's statement to the Obama transition team outlined the association's positions on free public access to government information, public domain citation, no fee access to PACER, as well as on copyright and privacy concerns. Presently, AALL has state working groups that are engaged in efforts to preserve authentic print publication of official legal materials when states threaten to stop printing materials without creating authenticated electronic versions, to ensure that electronic information which is unofficial contains clear disclaimers about that fact, and now to assist with creation of a national inventory of primary legal materials, something that Erica Wayne will discuss this afternoon in her talk. Um, I wanted to show you some pictures, of course, of law library. So here are two famous law librarians, uh, one sitting on a stuffed horse in front of his library, and the other one deep in thought about legal research. In fact, that's the picture from the cover of a book which is called Thinking Deep Thoughts About Legal Research. So clearly that's what's going on. Uh, this is Roy Mursky, who was for many years the law librarian at the University of Texas. Bob Baring, who was for many years the law librarian at, at Bolt Hall. Uh, Roy and Bob are also two of the authors of the primary texts and treatises on legal research. And all of those texts, all of those books, define legal research as the search for authority. 
Which leads us then to ask, what is authority? What sources are authoritative? Now, if you, if you research this a little bit, you can find out what Fred Schauer says. And what Fred says is that the status of a source as authority is the product of an informal, evolving, and scalar process by which some sources become progressively more and more authoritative as they are increasingly used and accepted. Fred's own research has suggested that U.S. courts are citing an increasingly wide range of sources as authority for their decisions. But I think what matters to us here is the more traditional view of what stands as legal authority. Uh, these are sources that are issued officially by bodies authorized to create law. Cases, statutes, administrative rulings and regulations, the things usually referred to as the primary sources of the law. Now, access to the primary sources of law has not always been easy for American lawyers. Throughout the 19th century, what they wanted was case law. They wanted reports of judicial opinions that had established precedents for resolving new problems. Immediately after the American Revolution, there was little published American case law to be found, and lawyers, and lawyers and courts relied much more than they wished to on English sources to find out the law. Kirby's Reports, which is pictured here, was the first volume of state law reports in the U.S. It came out in 1789, but by 1810, there were really only about 20 published volumes of reported cases in the U.S. Regular reporting of appellate opinions began really in the early 19th century when the courts started requiring written opinions from the bench and states began appointing official reporters. Uh, James Kent began the practice of written reports when he came to the bench in New York State. By 1824, there were about 200 published volumes of reports. Uh, Wheaton versus Peters in 1834 established that U.S. Supreme Court opinions could not be copyrighted. Banks versus Manchester in 1888 was the last of a series of cases that seemed to put to rest questions about copyright and state court opinions. What these decisions did was to make it possible for commercial and other unofficial publishers to get into the business of publishing court opinions alongside the official reporters uh, for the states. After the Civil War, courts issued increasingly larger numbers of opinions, and there were concerns expressed at the ABA meetings about the multiplicity of reports throughout the latter quarter of the, of the 19th century. It was written about in the professional literatures as, as well. American lawyers felt that they were being swamped by the number of opinions that they had to deal with. Because the official reporters hadn't been able to meet the demand that lawyers had for new case law, in a timely fashion, the commercial publishers created competing versions. For some states in the, 19, in the 1880s, there were two or three versions of Supreme Court opinions available. In the midst of all this, John B. West, who is shown here, began publishing a weekly newsletter in 1876 with the title The Syllabi, which provided summaries of cases for Minnesota lawyers. By the end of the century, West Publishing Company had established, however, a near monopoly on publication of state and federal reports for all the states as well as for federal cases, and eventually drove most of its competitors out of business. West's philosophy was simple. Everything issued by the courts should be published and made available quickly to American lawyers, who feared, of course, not finding that one case on, fours, on all fours which would resolve their issue. From approximately 1875 to 1975, nationwide access to state and federal cases was almost exclusively through West publications, the reporters and the digest and finding tools and other things that they published. By 1975, when the first electronic legal research systems were introduced, an estimated 3 million reported decisions had been issued by U.S. reports, published decisions, with about 44,000 new opinions being added to the total each year. The published law was available in print, but it needed to be housed and organized, made available and preserved. And in the late 19th century, we saw the development of the great American law libraries, first in bar associations and then in university law schools. This is the Harvard Law Library, and I don't know how much that guy actually used those books, but there he is. Um, it's, it's funny because when you do a Google search for Harvard Law Library, this is the picture that comes up. <laughs> Government documents, 
and depository libraries also provided some access for the public, particularly after reforms in the distribution system in 1895 made congressional materials and other federal materials more available more widely throughout the country than they had been previously. Here's uh, Morris Cohen, another great law library, I know, I'm not sure that's the best picture of it. Um, Describe the situation facing, of legal, facing users of legal information in the 20th century. The amount of law to be considered on almost any issue continued to grow, and as new information technologies began to be applied to law in the last quarter of the 20th century, lawyers were faced not only with enormous amounts of information, but with, but with what Jason Wilson calls a feast of formats that took us from print to digital via microforms, floppy disks, CD-ROMs, and online websites. Lexis and Westlaw were initially called computer-assisted legal research systems when they were introduced in the mid-1970s. And they appeared around 1975 in approximately the same, as prox approximately the same things that they are today. High cost, premium, full text databases, mostly of primary source legal materials. Electronic, digital, but very conservative in their approach because they were designed for direct use and marketed for direct use by attorneys themselves. The Lexis Custom Terminal, which is up in the upper left on the screen, uh, was, as you can see, was an entire desk, which had a keyboard, a monitor, that's a modem sitting underneath the monitor, and this was de described at the time by some people as being the moron's Cadillac. And um, we used to have one of these in the library. The one that we first had looked a lot like that, except it had an acoustic coupler modem, if you remember those. This was something where you took a telephone and you stuck it into the, into the modem, dialed the number, and then you connected for us to Lexus's uh, system, which was in Washington. We, in those days, only had Lexus available to us for about two or three hours a day, but we had a local phone line uh, going to DC that ran all day long so that when we weren't, somebody wasn't using the terminal for Lexus searching, our faculty would come down and use the phone as a local phone call to DC. Tom Rowe was famous, it's natural. Um, but eventually uh, Lexus came up with the smaller terminal which you see in color on the right which was called the Ubic for ubiquitous. I think we like the way that those Matthew Bender books are sort of pouring into the terminal. <laughs> And, uh, and that was designed, of course, to bring legal research right to the desktop. You could have one of these little red dedicated terminals sitting on your desk and no longer had to come and use that big desk-sized terminals. Now, because Lexis and Westlaw and other seem to be, and Lexis and Lex Lexis seem to be like electronic versions of the reporters and other law books. Westlaw, of course, was based on the books that West published, and so it was natural for lawyers to believe that their contents were, contents, rather, were authentic. And, of course, the information was accessible to those who needed it, lawyers, and those who could pay the price for it, of course, who were also lawyers. There wasn't any thought then about public access. Was the, were they permanent? Was the information in the digital formats accessed by Alexis and Westlaw permanent in the same way that the books in the library were? No, of course not, but nobody thought about that. No one cared because the book still existed. When Westlaw was first introduced in 1975 or so, it didn't have the text of cases. It merely functioned as an index to the books in the library that West published. Beginning in the 1990s, of course, legal information began to become more available electronically than through those two services, not only to professional users, but also much more readily to the public. Uh, and from sources other than the premium vendors, lower cost sources and free sources. Uh, the lower cost sources, which were marketed mainly toward lawyers, had more limited content than Lexis and Westlaw, and some but not all of the features of those services. They were marketed to the bar. Examples of this are Case Maker, Lois Law, Fast Case versus Law. There are others that have come and gone over time. Free access to at least some materials became more accessible through court websites, through government sources for the federal government, GPO Access and Thomas, and through Cornell's Legal Information Institute and other sites that were designed specifically to improve public access to the law and to make legal sources freely available. So today, 
American law is clearly much more accessible electronically and sometimes in print than ever before, but not necessarily easily or reliably accessible. In the rich legal information environment of the early 21st century, some of the same questions apply as in the late 1880s. How can I get this stuff? And certainly there is still way too much of this stuff to have to deal with. But there are new questions. And the new questions are, where did this stuff come from? Is it authentic? And where did it go? Who was supposed to be saving it? The difference between this time and the era of the great libraries is that we can no longer assume that libraries will provide access to authenticated legal information or to preserve it in the ways they did in the past when the law was published in books that libraries collected, kept, and preserved. But does anybody care? As authoritative legal information is published only in digital formats, there aren't going to be any print sources to turn to to verify authenticity. And we can't assume the authenticity, even of official sources published electronically, unless some mark of authentication is provided. And the trust, well-placed or not, that American lawyers once gave to Lexis and Westlaw's databases doesn't necessarily obtain when cases, statutes, and other authorities are widely available on the web, more cheaply, or for free from a variety of sources. Where did Google Scholar get those cases, anyway? Do we know? And as Jason Wilson colorfully put it in his blog last year, authenticity is not the first concern for lawyers who are trying to find free or low-cost access to the materials that they need. As a result, it's also unlikely to be the first concern of citizen researchers who are merely trying to find the law and then make some sense of it once they do. But this is an era, this slide now is going to be wasted. You'll see why. This is an era in which the National Archivist blogs about Martians <laughs> while issuing his agency's first open government plan, which is a plan to vastly improve the public's use of government records, not only by making them available on the web, but also by developing a social catalog which will allow users to employ social media, web 2.0 technologies, to contribute their own thoughts to descriptions of the documents. The last thing I put here on my notes is, what a guy, but where is he, is I guess the question. David is going to be with us, I believe, this afternoon. It's not, he's at the, the rally uh, So here we are again. Same basic issues for legal text that I mentioned at the beginning. This is an era also in which public demand for access to the law has never been greater. Uh, and as Peter Manel, the director of the Bold Hall Center for Law and Technology, recently wrote, modern digital technology provides unprecedented opportunities to promote preservation and access to knowledge. The challenge for all of us is going to be to ensure that efforts to improve access to the law for the public and for legal professionals will take into consideration the needs for authentication and preservation as well as access. And it is for this that I think we all look forward with excitement to the possibilities of the Law.gov project. Thank you. Hewing beautifully to our time, time schedule, a uh, brief, brief set of questions, and then we can move on. I have one, Dick. Um, where in what you said is the place of the secondary materials? Because obviously that's something where um, you've been extremely um, active. Um, the role of law reviews, commentaries, and so forth. How do you see those two things working together? Well, at least in the U.S., there are increasingly large amounts of secondary materials being made available on the web in repositories held in law schools and in other places. The key thing in the area, I think, that is going to be a matter of particularly, particular importance for law librarians to be working in is how we link those things together. Um, as you know, Michael Carroll has said that access to the law is essential, but if that's true, then access, access to commentary, and scholarship about the law is equally essential so that you can have the two things work together and one who finds the law has some way of understanding what it's really about and how it's been interpreted. I think that what we're going to need to do is, I think, take the direction that David, has, is, is, uh, David uh, Ferriero is 
suggesting for the National Archives and find ways to use social computing technologies to bring those things together. I think that's, there's a role there for, for law schools to find ways to link primary source and secondary source material so that all of this material becomes more.